Welcome to the Morally End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined by Dominic Machado in the States and over in South London is Nick Brooks, the doyen of Sri Lankan cricket. Uh, we want to keep this brief because me and Nick are going to go and eat uh, lamb chops and Thai abs very shortly. Um, and before we get cracking into it, I've got to remind you to firstly hit the subscribe button for this. If you're listening to the podcast, if you watch it on YouTube, hit the subscribe. Um, and also remind you to subscribe to our newsletter. Every week we have some great writing coming out. This week as pod uh, newsletter, sorry, came out on Thursday, and we Dom talked about the T20 squad and the composition of it, and I wrote a piece about Charith Asalanka, and um, obviously reading that piece immediately he went and got um, injured slash ill and was unavailable for the third t20 game which Sri Lanka did win meaning that they have won the series against Zimbabwe 2-1 Dom we're recording this minutes after the game is over they've just handed a giant uh, check to Hasaranga what's your kind of immediate thoughts after at the end of this series yeah it's a, a mixed bag I've uh I've expressed this to you both in our uh, in our in our chats, but there's kind of a bizarre feeling around this team right now. Um, we talked last week about the selection and how the selection is going to play out, and we talked a lot about Angelo Matthews' role in the selection and some of the dilemmas it brought out, and he has to be the story of the series, right? So he comes out that first first game. Um, he bowls with the new ball, is economical, and then he kind of holds together this innings to lead Sri Lanka to squeak by in a chase of 144. Um, to be fair, it was not a great innings. It was 46 off of 38, but that flatters the way that he batted. A lot of those came off of educated edges. Um, I think at one point he was 6 for 15 from the innings. Uh, so it, Angelo Matthews then comes out and talks about how he's been kept out of the team due to agenda. And and we're all thinking, no, man, it's because you just haven't played well in T20 cricket in years. Right. And we needed new blood. And so. The next game comes around, uh, we bat first and we have this horrible collapse, 27 for four. Angelo comes in and he's playing his same kind of slow paced innings. I think he's five off of 15 this time, but he presses the accelerator and he, we see these shots, these huge sixes over cow corner, um, smashing fours over the bowler's head, real power from Angelo. And I think he gets um, something like 40 off of his last 15. And he looks like a real T20 power hitter. And we're thinking, Oh my gosh, he still has this in him. It looks like he's jumped into a time machine, gone back to 2014 and put himself back in after 20 balls, right? And um, they put up 173 after being in a kind of hairy spot. So then I think I was thinking to myself, am I totally misled about Angelo not having a role in this team? Is this something that, you know, I, I've, I've, thought wrongly about i've bought into the agenda merchants who have expressed you know the doubts about angelo matthews and then zimbabwe is chasing 174 with our bowling lineup we're always going to back ourselves to chase that and angelo is off the park at the beginning so he doesn't take the new ball and he ends up bowling the last over with 20 to defend first he bowls a no ball off of his 115 kph dibby dobblers and then he gives up 26 runs. And we think, okay, there's no way he should be bowling at the death. Absolutely not. Maybe as a spot in the in, in the team as a batter, but should he be bowling these overs when we have so many good bowling options? And then, of course, today, what happens? We bowl first, and who gets the new ball? It's Angelo. And in his first two overs, he has two breakthroughs. And again, I was thinking to myself, why are we giving him the new ball? We have Dilshan Maduchanka and Dushmantha Chamira who can definitely make good use of that new ball and take early wickets. And Matthews does the thing. So for me, this is a series about Angelo Matthews. It's a series, it's a series that's defined by kind of a bizarre set of circumstances where we don't really have a good sense of the identity of our T20 team. And it seems like in this madness, in this sort of descent into 
all sorts of questions. Angelo Matthews is almost like a talisman for this team, not because he's indispensable, but because his the, the sort of confusion that he sets off embodies what's going on with Sri Lankan cricket right now. We don't know which way is up. We don't know what to expect. And anything can happen. Sorry, that was overlong, but I I feel very passionately about uh, what's going on, and I I can't really believe what I'm watching, to be honest. No, no I, like I, I think it was a really great description of kind of where we're at, right? Because it feels like Angelo Matthews kind of represents every aspect of, of Sri Lankan cricket right now, right? He's be I, I can't remember how when he made his debut, but it was quite a while ago. What what was it? Twenty twenty nine, uh, two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's had. I mean, if if his career, if he didn't play another game for Sri Lanka in any format after today, which I don't think will be the case, um, <laughs> that he still had quite a spectacular career, right? He's he's in the kind of pantheon of of all time great Sri Lankan cricketers. The what he's trying to do now, what happens at this point though, is going to leave such a is 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 the it's the kind of final course of the Angelo Matthews um, buffet, right? Um, and this the last three games, I think we've seen every single aspect of what can and can't can't happen <laughs> with, with 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 him. And I've heard a lot of commentary around his career and around him and the kind of person he is. In the lot, like since he's come back for this series, and I think there's every single possible opinion that can, people can hold, pe- people currently hold about Angelo Matthews. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up running in the US presidential race again <laughs> at this point because you kind of feel anything is possible with, with Angelo Matthews, they'll change the rules, and you know, it's they'll somehow make it that you have to be born in America or or Colombo to, to be able to, to run, right? Um. Just every single opinion out there, people have about him. I think ultimately, though, when you look at what he has achieved and and the commentary around him and the way fans are starting to talk about him, I think there is a kind of almost melancholy about it because for every one person who's a, who is absolutely brought into the Angelo Matthews fan club, there is somebody who sees them as a bit of a liability, and I think that it's there is two kind of paths that this could go down. One where everyone who sees him as a liability is vindicated and actually he has games like he did on Tuesday where his brilliance is is coupled with moments of utter madness like that final over. Or actually he, he stays in the team and we see the better side of him. We see the leader that he was kind of groomed to be really come out and really stand by Hasaranga, really uh, make Sri Lanka play innovative cricket that gets them big, big wins in places. And he goes on to kind of finish his his international career, with, with, which could last well beyond this year, but in, in, in a really, really healthy state. But I think at the moment, there's so much debate around, around his position in the team. He's really got to put some really superstar performances in, which he kind of got half off of Tuesday on Tuesday. He's got to put those in really consistently. And then I think we might, we could, we hope see a really special end to his career. If, you know, we are the twilight in his career. I mean, who knows? It's Angelo Matthews. He could be playing in 10 years time, right? <laughs> um, uh, and that's, I think that's what we all want to see is that is, that right, Nick? Are we being fair or are we being grossly unfair to Angelo? And actually, um, if you look at his last three LPL performances, he should definitely be in this side. I don't know the answer to that, Marky. I think <laughs> I said to you guys, I feel really conflicted about his series uh, because there were times during the innings on Tuesday and the innings on Sunday, you know, where he's just like flat batting balls when I'm all, you're almost like screaming at the TV, what the hell are you doing, Angelo? But then it's hard to criticise a guy who's scored 60 odd and a 40 odd when your top four up until today have scored nothing between them, essentially. Uh, it's, it's a tricky one. Um, Angelo has shown a kind of, to an extent, a head on his shoulders and the 
um, benefits of maturity. I mean, him and Shanaka, I thought there was a bit of luck on Sunday. I think, as Dom mentioned, there were two edges in the 19th over through the vacant slip region, which ended up going to the boundary and kept Sri Lanka in the chase. But they did take it deep where the other batsmen weren't able to do that. Uh, so it's a really... It's a really conflicting thing, but I think my overriding feeling from this series is that Sri Lanka shouldn't be going life and death with Zimbabwe, uh, a team who have missed out on World Cup qualification uh, and been beaten out to that by Uganda. I mean, I thought that the series was going to go like the game today did, where Zimbabwe's batting just wouldn't be strong enough to cope with Sri Lanka's bowling. And I think, you know... Sri Lanka were pretty lucky to get past that 140 in the first um, game. I thought there was moments of luck in the second game. And yeah, at the moment, for me, this T20 side just isn't working, isn't the sum of its parts when you consider how good the bowling could potentially be. And uh, I don't think there should be any sort of back patting after this series. And I think it should be really worrying for Sri Lanka how closely run this was. I, I think it's worth mentioning or dwelling on the Zimbabwe point, right? Because um, I actually think Zimbabwe, in, in a way, is not that dissimilar to the Shrunker side because they've got a really good bowling unit mm -hmm. and then they've got batters who probably, like, I think there's quite a big gap between Shrunker's batters who might be misfiring and Zimbabwe's batters. But the, the point is, though, is that there's a huge gap between the bowlers and the batters for each team. And with, considering that, I thought the the result of losing the game on Tuesday, the way they lost it, was that when Sri Lanka won the toss today, they had to make Zimbabwe bat first because they had to kind of do everything they could for the win. And the easiest way to do that was to was to put them into bat and for us to chase. The problem is, though, is that if Sri Lanka are going to become a good T20 side, mm -hmm. if this side is going to go on and develop, this is the kind of exactly the kind of game months out of a World Cup that they should have batted first and if they had the opportunity to and try and figure out our batting mm -hmm. because that's the only way our batting is going to improve. Because realistically today, what did we learn? We learned we have really good bowlers, but we knew that anyway. And we knew that uh, we could chase that at 82 relatively quickly. Um, and we also know that our openers tend to score runs when they have little to chase. Um our openers and our top four don't do well under pressure, mm. um, which they would have put themselves under if they would batted first. And that's why I think at this point, winning this series, really, if Sri Lanka is about winning World Cups and if it's about going deep in tournaments and if it's about challenging the bigger cricket player nations, uh, and, you know, maybe that's slightly disrespectful to Zimbabwe, and I'm sorry about that, Um then I think Sri Lanka need to be looking to put themselves in the pressure positions today and batting first, not batting first, is a missed opportunity for me. Um, I, and especially because they changed the whole team round for it. Um, not changed the whole team round. I mean, Kaminda Mendes came in today. He did yeah. absolutely nothing, um, which I think happens too often is that we bring new players in and then we end up in situations where they haven't done anything. And the next thing you know, they're coming in to a crucial game in a, in a major tournament and everyone goes, it's all right, they've played 15 games, but you realise actually 12 of those games, they didn't get to bat or bowl. So really they've only played like three games. <laughs> like, yeah. um, uh, it, th There's a lot to talk about for Sri Lanka off the back of this series. I think the the one of the things one of the major discussion points that came out of the way Sri Lanka lost on Tuesday was, do we need to play five bowlers because we do not have the all-rounders to get to make that fifth bowler up if if we need some seam? Nick, what are your thoughts on that situation? Yeah, I think that Sri Lanka probably do need to play five bowlers. It's a funny one because, again, on Sunday I thought... Uh, Angelo and Shanika actually bowled well. They bowled two overs each and they were fairly economical. And on Sunday, it looked like a pitch which really pace off was the way to go when um, Tushara and Shamira, I think, went for 80-odd against everyone else going for 60. And I thought Sri Lanka were a little bit inflexible in that first game, uh, that maybe there was an opportunity to give Asalanka an over or to give Shanika or Matthews another over instead of having Tushara and Shamira 
bowl their full quota. And then that narrative just completely turned on its head on Tuesday, where Matthews and Shanaka are going around the park. I think Sri Lanka do need to play five specialist bowlers or at least have a bit more bowling depth. Shana couldn't bowl today, and he's now really starting to look more and more like a finisher who gives you an odd over here or there. I also think, I mean, it's not quite answering your question, Marky, but I think that this top six at the moment simply isn't good enough for Hasaranga to be batting at eight and um, to have faced two balls this series. You know, I know he got a first baller in the first one, so that's not the management's fault, but I think we need to see what he's what he can do given time to bat up the order for Sri Lanka and having him bat in the top six, I'm getting to the stage when I'm wondering should he even be batting in the top four, uh, that frees up some space to include another specialist bowler without weakening the batting lineup too much. Yeah, I think when we heard he was being made captain, I think we all assumed he'd be batting higher up. But you, you, I, I, I'm guessing you're in agreement with what Nick says about Hasarangu's where, where he bats, Dom. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, Hasaranga is not the only person that would benefit from five specialist bowlers and kind of everyone sliding up one spot on the batting spot, uh, batting order. I think um, Charith should be batting higher. Um, the quality that he's kind of shown the last couple matches, his improvement, he needs to face more balls. He's someone that I'm OK with if he takes seven, eight balls to get in, because once he starts going he can provide impetus to an innings. Um, he really did that uh, in the game on Tuesday. That was a, some phenomenal hitting, smart hitting. He negotiated the bowlers well, um, both against pace and against spin. So I think um, Asalanka is someone who should be batting in the top four. I don't think there's any question about that. Maybe even uh, bat at three and keep Sidira at four. And then someone like Angelo, it also benefits, right? If he comes in at five rather than say six, you can play out a few balls, right? It's not it's not an immediate rush. But if you come in at the end, you can bring in Wainindu or you can bring in uh Shanika. I think Shanika's come in at uh he came in at eight the first match and seven the last match. And clearly, uh, I think as Nick said, they're using him as a finisher. But I think everyone could stand to move up one spot. And that the spot that I think goes is the KJP DDS spot. Um, I think you keep with Kusal and Patham up top. Then you go to Charith and Sadira. And then, you know, the way Matthews is batting right now, if he can if he can reduce the number of dot balls and get into the hitting phase earlier, um, you can live with him at five. Is it is it ideal? Um, you know, I'd rather have an informed Bonica in that spot. But then you have, you know, Shanika, Hasaranga, six, seven, um, I think that that's a strong a strong side, and uh, bringing in someone like uh, Matisha gives you so many options. You can bowl him. You basically can use up a bowler who is bowling really well. Someone like Dilshan Madushanka. You can maybe even give him three overs in the power play to make use of that new ball. Um, even though we saw Angelo get wickets today, I still think it's a mistake to not give your best bowlers and especially bowlers who are skilled with the new ball the new ball um and have a crack at batters before they're set um if we're playing india right if we're playing rohit sharma and 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 uh gill or dicewall or whoever it is right they're not going to be forgiving on angelo matthews they're going to be going hell for leather trying to get 20 runs off of that over so i think i agree that the six five lineup works well. And we have someone in Hasaranga who's a real batter who can be really play that all rounder spot. And then you, you know, God forbid there's an injury or you need someone to take the pace off the ball. You have Shanika and Matthews there. And that's a pretty well balanced side to me. Yeah, I, I think, I think you're, you're probably right. I think I personally think, and I know I mentioned this, uh, was it last week? I think KJ, KJP's time in, in T20 cricket needs, I don't think it's done per se, but I think he needs a massive rethink. I need, I think he needs to go to, to go away from the squad for a little bit and have a, have find this form somewhere else. I don't know, go play in Bangladesh or go and play some leagues around the world and, and try and find some form and come back in. Cause I think on, on merit currently right now, I don't think he's in the side. 
Um, I thought it was interesting having DDS at three. I think, um, again, this is what I mean by it was a kind of missed opportunity if they're going to if they're going to change the team around. I know he got back, kind of he finished the game to, off today for for SL, but it was kind of a frivolous thing, right? We only needed what like eighteen mm -hmm. runs when he off, off quite a lot of balls uh, when when he came in. So I mean, I I don't know, maybe maybe he could be a, a top order solution at some point and I, I i i do think that by moving everyone up i think it it kind of relaxes some of the players a little bit because I th angelo clearly loves loves bowling and will do what he what needs to be done for the team but i don't necessarily think that means that we need to get him to bowl right <laughs> like yeah. um and i i just don't think shardica wants to bowl like um we saw that towards the back end of his own captaincy, where when he first started, when he first took over the captaincy, he was more than happy to bowl the, the death overs um, in when we were defending, where now that doesn't really seem to be the case. I think his bowling is quite pedestrian as well. Um, I think the role he's got to play in the team is is by scoring big and scoring quickly, mm -hmm. right? So I think 6-5 has just got to be be the way and I also think it kind of plays into our strengths a little bit more right because playing we're kind of playing a weird hybrid with kind of four bowlers and two or th kind of three or four all-rounders and then three and a half all-rounders and three and a half batters and yeah. the whole thing's just not made I don't think it makes much sense for anyone um at the moment um should we kind of move on towards and, and look at what's next which is a um, an Afghan. The Afghans are, are are coming over. We're going to play them in all three formats. Nick, I think you're hoping to be there for the test match, right? I certainly am, Marky. At least the first four days. So hopefully, I'll all see right, well. most of the action. Yeah, that that'd be quite good. I think I think the teams. I feel the squads are like pretty kind of even. Um, obviously, like we won't, none of us will forget the Asia Cup game we had with them recently. Um, and you know we we just about got over the line for that, and then they they beat us um, in the end quite convincingly at, during the World Cup. Um, I think it's a it's a good next step on towards the World Cup. Um, I am a bit nervous after what Afghanistan managed to do against India yesterday, where they took them to not just one super over but two super <laughs> overs. Uh, Dom, are you are you worried? I'm definitely worried. I think a couple of things. So one about Afghanistan, obviously they've been playing well and I love the way they've set up their batting lineup. It's almost the inverse of ours where, you know, our top five is four anchors and, and one aggressive player. They have four aggressive players and one anchor. Um, they're going hell for leather. Um, they've got some real power in Muhammad Nabi, Gulbadin up the order and they seem to be doing a real job there. Um, so that's going to be tough to bowl to given how easily they can clear the boundaries. I think, and this sounds strange to say, I think we have the bowling edge actually. I think our bowling side is, is a little bit better than theirs. And I think, um, we have to use it as kind of a, a way to think about tactics. Um, Mark, you mentioned batting first. I think that's an area where Sri Lanka has struggled the last 24 months and particularly in t20 cricket um they've been good chasing even steep totals um in the asia cup they chased you know a couple of 170s and one 180 total i think if they know the pace they have to play they can adjust their game but i think it's that idea of setting a score and what do i need to do to set a score uh which is giving them trouble so i think that's one area where we'll particularly look for them to improve um and yes, Afghanistan did play well against India. But remember last year, we actually won a game in India against India in the T20 series. We scored 206 batting first, one of the rare instances where we did that. And we probably should have won that series. I think we had four from three to get in the first game, and we ended up losing by two runs. Um, so I do think I, I do think that um, we are a good T20 side. I think some of it also is getting into the rhythm of T20 batting. Um, and getting into the rhythm of being aggressive, getting singles, not being, you know, you, you have to be busy at the crease. So I think I, I, I want to say that 
we can maybe give the batters a little bit of a look see if we see the same problems crop up in the next series then we'll know we do have have some issues um yeah so i feel i feel excited i think it's going to be a really good test of our batters it's going to be a really good test of our bowlers i think one thing that i've i was thinking about when i was thinking about that afghanistan india game is um the pitches right the premadasa has its own special characteristics and we know how it's going to play i wonder how much afghanistan has learned from not having home series always having to travel somewhere always having to play in somebody else's conditions so adaptability right for the batters and bowlers in afghanistan is a top top quality that they do have and i was thinking we play really well at home sometimes right where we look like we can beat anyone at home uh, but when we play in foreign conditions conditions that we haven't practiced right we struggle so um thinking about what kind of pitches we want to set up for that Afghanistan series to provide the best practice for um, the World Cup that's coming up. Granted, we don't know too much about some of those pitches that we're going to see. And we do know that sometimes West Indies has slow, low pitches that are much like what you'd find at the Prima Dasa. So um, it's a bit of it's a it's a bit tricky when it comes to what type of pitches you want to you want to put together. Well, Tom, you you were our correspondent in in the New York or the tri-state area and I assume that means that you take your job quite seriously and that you go to East Meadow every other every few days and inspect the pitch um and weren't you telling me in a WhatsApp chat that you think it's going to play exactly like Gaul yeah I mean I I've been uh you know we've we have a special weather maker that we've been putting out there you know we're like okay let's uh, up the temperature to 35 degrees, have a huge rain shower every every night, um, all that stuff. It's going to play just like Gaul. Um, South Africa is going to go there and get blown away. We're going to open the bowling with Dikshana and, uh, and Chara Thessalonka, and they're going to blow through that uh, South African top order. Oh, gosh, could you imagine? What a day that's going to be. We've seen the pictures now of what the ICC reckons um that that new york stadium could potentially the pop-up stadium could potentially look like it's quite it looks quite extraordinary and and hopefully um i'll be able to somehow get myself there yeah like well i know dom you'll be able to and I'll maybe nick you might be with us um as so. well that'd be class i can't wait i don't know what it is about the fact that struggle get to play in new york yeah that is uh <laughs> feels so exciting. exciting yeah um um, anyway, guys, I think that's pretty much everything we're going to talk about in this episode, unless there's something pressing. Um, uh, earlier on today, there was rumours that John T. Rhodes was about to become fielding coach for Sri Lanka, but those rumours were fastly quelled after we read the press release, and <laughs> it was like, no, he's coming to help coach some other coaches, <laughs> as as well as, um, I think they're bringing in a, a fast bowling coach from India, and... Uh, reshuffling some of the way the physiotherapy training is done i'd like to see how that actually works in practice though but um does it you know is it effective you know can you how quickly can you coach coaches to be uh to be better coaches we're, we're, we're gonna find out right because there seems to be quite a lot of movement mm. with what's going on behind the scenes in slc at the moment um so we'll be back with with all of that if you've got this far and you haven't subscribed to the newsletter that's incredible um i think the link is muralyend.substack.com the links in the bio and in the description uh please hit the subscribe to this if you're watching on youtube or if you're listening in the podcast app um hit subscribe follow us on social media we're on instagram we're on tiktok we're on uh twitter we're also on facebook but i never go on facebook <laughs> um and and get involved and tell us what you think if you wake up in the middle of the night and have a thought about shrunk and cricket then just tweet us. There's probably one of us to wake anyway, because we all live in different time zones. Uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Bye.